Hey everybody, Jimmy Smith. I'm back again. It's been a while, I know. A lot of stuff going on. So anyway, it's time for another Fight Quest story. This time it's Kalari Payetu in India. But first, I have to respond to some criticism. I knew I was going to get them. And I did. Uh, I was looking around at the comments for my Kajikembo episode breakdown. And there's a guy, Ron Estrella, who was part of the Kajikembo team when I was there in San Jose. Nice guy. I like him a lot. Um, anyway, he commented on the the Kajikembo episode, and I want to read what he wrote and respond to it. Some truth, but not much. Truth. Unfortunately, there was nobody there. And I want to... He put that in all caps. There was no one there in all caps that was on your level on location. If the producer had a plan, it certainly wasn't shared. In fact, was last minute changed many times. I'm reading what he wrote. Having the right people there on shoot day would have been great. Could have given John Halcomen a call and he could have sent Chuck Liddell or Glover. He called him Grover Teixeira, but Glover Teixeira, down to represent both from a Kaju based school. Um, what he's talking about is John Halcomen, the pit down in uh, San Luis Obispo, that was, um, who was Chuck Liddell's coach. Even the master you tapped, and you put that in quotes who was 50 and really only a BJJ Brown could have brought some of his actual fighters. Maybe even a 16-year-old Michael Mayday McDonald, 19-4, and four, professional record, nine UFC fights, including a title shot. How many UFC, how many fights did you have in the UFC? Oh, yeah, zero. True. The producers should have billed us as a MMA style. Okay, Ron. Uh, first off, I can't comment on who wasn't there. That's it. Truth. Unfortunately, there was nobody there that was on your level on location. Okay. You should have brought him, first off. Secondly, I didn't know anything about Kajikembo any more than I knew anything about any of the other combative styles like uh, Kyokushin uh, karate in, in Japan. Had no idea. I learned there what the style was about. If you didn't have guys there who were on the level to be combative in any way. What does that say about the gym? That you had to go get them from somewhere else. The other combative styles I went to, uh, boxing in Mexico City, Kajikembo in, in uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kyokushin in Japan, certainly Gracie Humata in, in Brazil, all those guys trained there regularly. They didn't find anybody for me to spar with or fight or bring in ringers or anything like that. They literally, when I was in Mexico, they were like, who wants to spar with Jimmy? All right, who's warm? All right, you, get in there. And he was like a Mexican Olympian. So they had plenty of guys all over the place that could fight me. They didn't have to go to another school. They didn't have to make any phone calls. They didn't have to bring in anybody. So the idea that there were better people that weren't there, I don't know that wasn't my job to study the whole style and find out who's good and talk about them, even though they're not there training with me. None of the other styles did that. Uh, also, the master I tapped, he puts in quotes, that guy was your instructor. He's a brown belt, yes. I was a purple belt. I should not be able to wrist lock him in under a minute. That should not happen. As for his age, my instructor, hey, Giogo, the guy who gave me my black belt, 55. Pull guard on him and wrist lock and watch what happens. It's not about age. The guy didn't have great technique. He didn't. Is he a good instructor? I don't know. His guys were okay. The point is his age and his belt level, the guy wasn't that good. So you can write it off to the fact that he's 50, and I was much younger than that. But I've rolled with guys a lot older than him who I could not do that to and have no hope against. I've rolled with a lot of masters who were older. And you can tell the technique and it wasn't there. So another thing is this was not an ambush show. We didn't show up at a gym with a camera and challenge everybody. And they had no time. The instructors at your school had weeks, if not months, to bring in anyone they wanted to give the impression of the school they wanted to give. If there were guys at other schools, they had plenty of time. To bring them in. I'm sure I went to a lot of gyms for Fight Quest where they kind of packed the gym. Hey, there's going to be a camera crew here. Come on, guys. Everybody show up and represent. Great. Wonderful. They could have done that too. No one surprised them with anything. Yeah, the plans on shooting days change. They always do. We used the guys that were available, that were at the gym. And what we got is what I talked about. 
So if you wanted to bring in guys to make your school look better, whatever you want to make your style look better, whatever your motivation would be, you had plenty of time to do that. We did not surprise you. We didn't show up unannounced. They could have done that and they didn't. None of those things are my problem. Not my fault. Not anybody's fault. So the idea that you, you, your school didn't show everything it had, it had plenty of time to get those resources if it wanted to. So your own argument, that, oh, we could have brought in other guys. Well, you should have, I guess. I only know what I faced there. And all I've said when talking about that style is none of those guys could handle me in an actual MMA fight. And so if you wanted the, the, the producers to bill you as an MMA school, it's hard to get out of the fact that I couldn't go to the ground with them in the final fight. Because if they had billed you as an MMA school, there's no excuse for me to not take you down and submit you. Because I couldn't do that at AKA. I couldn't do that at Jackson Wink. I couldn't do that at American Top Team. Any of the MMA schools that they could have gone to, there's no way I'd go in there and blow everybody away with a simple double leg and leg lock. Couldn't do that. So that's my response to Ron Australia. Nice guy. I like him. Probably doesn't like me anymore. But anyway, I had to start off talking about that. So Kalur Payetu in India was a, a non-combative style from the beginning. We knew that. So going in, we were like, look, it's got to be about the culture and the food and the exotic elements of where we were. We're in a place called Kerala, which is, is in southern India. It's right on the coast. It is beautiful out there. Really beautiful. Um, a lot of jungle, uh, kind of unspoiled, really. We were in this, I, I don't know the difference between a city and a town in India because they're big by my standards, but I don't know if it's big by Indian standards. And... It's really Muslim there. It's really communist. They had a, a, this like political rally when we were there, and there were literally like red communist fa flags flying everywhere. And I asked kind of our fixer translator guy, I said, what's going on here? And they go, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty normal here. It's, it's much more communist in this kind of rural, conservative Muslim area. We got no static from anybody. I mean, nobody was, you know, anti-American or anything like that. Everyone was extremely friendly, but culturally it was, it was really different. Uh, women wore really long dresses and all that stuff, so... There was a little culture shock there. And then the food, our joke uh, while we were shooting was, what are you guys going for, Indian? Indian? Because that's really all they had. I mean, I've been to big cities, you know, or I went to Mumbai later uh, in Indian. You can get anything you want to eat. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. It's like any other big city. This was not a big city. So pretty much Southern Indian food was the only thing we ate the entire time. I like Indian food a lot, fortunately. But that's we had three meals a day. So I know some of the producers who were there for weeks were like dying for any other kind of food by the time we got there. But, you know, I was only there for 13 days, whatever it was. So it wasn't bad to me. But anyway, so the style itself, once again, we knew wasn't combative. So the challenge becomes, and it was in previous episodes that didn't have combative styles. What can we show here that's interesting and different? And a lot of it was the weapon stuff. A lot of it was the, the uh, training area. It's called, I believe, a kelleri, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. If I'm not, please correct me. Um, which is like a mud pit. So, because it's so hot there, what they do is is where you're training is like this outside wooden structure, but where you're actually, from the outside, but where you're actually training is they've dug about eight feet into the ground. So it's like this dark mud pit. Um, not mud, but, 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 but uh, dirt pit, basically. And it's cooler in there. So wherever we would train, it was basically on mud and the walls were, were not mud, but like, you know, uh, dirt. And we would be, it's a little wet and a little damp in there. So kind of muddy, but that was what we would train on the walls and everything, because it's the only place, the way you can stay cool. And then the outfit we wore, I never learned to tie it by myself, but it was this kind of rope thing that you tied around your, uh, waist and if you did it wrong, it strangled your nuts <laughs> because it's like this rope thing and you had to like tie it and cinch it. Well, if you get something wrong and they tie it and cinch it and it hurts like you would not believe. So I never learned to do it myself. I always need help to kind of like make sure I got it right and everything. So, so where we were was kind of exotic. The location of where we were actually training was exotic. The, the way you dressed was exotic. The weapon stuff was out there. And the first day I was there, I think, I'm walking with the instructor down this this like creek that runs next to the the training area and he goes stay away from that mini cobras 
I said, okay, no problem. I'll stay away from that. He goes, yeah, many cobras. Occasionally tigers come through the village and leave it alone. You know, so it was, it was exotic in that regard because I was kind of in the mountains a little bit. I was the one in the, in the, um, the kind of the jungle area. So he told me, he goes, don't go near any water. Cobras go there to drink. He's like, tigers, I would stay out of any thick jungle area if you can avoid it. So there were, there were uh, difficulties that, that had nothing to do with my actual training. And so um, we did the training every day. Um, interesting stuff because it was so, a lot of it was really formalized. A lot of it was kind of kata based and stuff. Uh, the weapon stuff we spent a lot of time on because it just looked different. And I'm not as accustomed to it. So it was cool. We had these like short wooden block things that we, and so those were the kind of weapons they had. So we had this form that I had to memorize with the other guy. And if you mess it up, it really cracked your fingers because it was a heavy wood thing. And we had to go back and forth and do this whole like stylized back and forth, almost dance thing. But it was tough because you messed it up and it killed you. So we started doing that. And the problem as you can guess with a non-combative style, is every time we would spar, what's kind of funny, this one guy with a mustache, I, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, uh, was the one guy I would always spar with. And I would try to kind of like pump him up and build him up and tell him like, you're doing a good job because he wasn't used to sparring. He wasn't used to actually throwing anything of substance. So I would pull him aside and go, dude, you're doing great. Come on, just go at me. Don't worry about it. Like, I'm not going to hurt you. But, you know, this has got to look good. So you got to, you know, go after me, man, you know? And so he's kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. He would kind of pump himself up. And then when he would get something or I would go, yeah, man, good. And, and you know, whether or not you could see it on camera, I was trying to, like, pump him up. And, yeah, come on, good job, good job. So that he would get comfortable sparring. And anybody knows who's done, you know, real fighting when you spar with somebody, you have to do that a lot with somebody who's, who's new or who's just getting it or even jujitsu and blue belt. And they kind of freeze up and, man, come on, you know, go for it. You know, attack and, and you know, um, make him feel comfortable. So that's what I was trying to do because I knew in the final fight he would be my guy. He was the only one who really had the heart to do it. And I, I'm not insulting anybody else, but he, he wanted to spar. He wanted to, like try out real fighting and so i knew he was gonna be my guy so i kind of spent the whole time trying to build him up and and a let him know i wasn't gonna hurt him but b like encourage him to to come after me a lot well another really well so when we would do that the instructor it's funny he would start turning it up and i go okay cool and i'd start turning up a little bit and the instructor would go no 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 stop 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 he would he would he would get nervous he would get scared so right when the my sparring partner would kind of get that like feeling of like, okay, cool, this is fun, we can do this, um, the instructor would kind of step up. And it would drive the producer nuts because he would go, oh, it was right when they were starting to get some good footage or whatever. So the producer would like, you know, kind of pull the instructor inside and go, look, they have to do something to, to let us know this style's, what this style can do. And so, but the guy, man, really, I mean, I, I really am impressed with that guy. And if, if, you, if you see him on the show, he's, he's the guy I fought in the final fight. Give that guy some respect because he was the only one that was like, yeah, I can fight this guy. Like, I'll, I'll spar. I'll do it, you know. And um, remember, I'm a lot bigger than most of these guys. Um, and they had never done any real combat sparring before. So he really stepped up and, 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 and helped out. And I really appreciate him for that. So Doug, on the other hand, was in the city. And he was doing – remember, I'm not there. I didn't see it until you guys saw it. But it came back to me because we weren't that far away I was in a different setting, but geographically, we weren't that far away. There are times when we were miles away. So the sound guy kind of bounced back and forth a little bit. And he told me, he goes, oh, man, yesterday. And I said, what happened? They were sparring with swords and a shield doing some kind of, once again, kind of a kata form, not really sparring or anything. And Doug threw a strike, hit the guy, hit the shield, and it bounced off the shield and hit the guy, cut right through the guy's lip. And they had to take, he had to get stitched up pretty good. It had two effects. Number one, it gave a sense of danger to the show and to the style that wasn't there otherwise. Okay, yes, we're doing katas and yes, we're doing forms, but if you mess up with a sword, it can hurt you. And so it kind of added that element, which was important. And number two, it really freaked Doug out. Because Doug liked the guy and, and, you know, they were doing okay. It really, Doug really didn't want to do any, any weapon stuff in the final fight. He really was like, I'm not doing that again. I'm not picking up one of these things. It really mentally kind of messed with Doug because the guy got hurt so badly. Um, so anyway, oh, sorry. So that was what happened on Duck in, Doug's end. He ended up kind of having this sparring session, that, that not or kata session that, that went bad, and this dude got really hurt. And then um, 
I wasn't doing any sword and mesh stuff. I was doing these these like wooden, like really thick uh, sticks. That was what, what we were doing. So anyway, a little side note that was very important in this episode was every time we shot a fight quest, we would have these conference calls where they were trying to make the sh- the show, I don't know about safer, but look, here's a line we had to ride. Us getting hurt was great television, and it showed how dangerous the style was and all this stuff, but if we get too hurt, we can't do the next show. So there's always this line of like, look, we want it intense, we want it real, but we can't have serious injuries because we didn't take a lot of time in between shoots. It was really, I was only home for like 10 days in between. For some reason, and it had nothing to do with Doug's injury, there was a big gap between Indonesia and uh, Mexico City. And if you remember, Doug really jacked his foot up in Indonesia. And it was just enough time that he could walk right before Mexico City. He wasn't great, but he could get through the training. Um, that was the only one that was that long. Uh, we, I, I said we had a long break between the last three, the, the first 10 and the last three. But other than that, we basically had 10 days in between shoots. That's not enough time to recover from a, a serious injury. So there were always these issues of how are we going to make it dangerous, essentially, but not make it so dangerous you guys get injured. And one of the things they said is they said, well, you know, if something's too dangerous, you know, you got to tell the instructor no. And I said, you guys don't understand the decorum of martial arts. I can't do that, right? If you go into Hickson's Academy and Hickson says 100 push-ups on your knuckles, you do 100 push-ups on your knuckles or else you don't train with Hickson. That's it. You can't say no and then continue training with the guy. So I I tried to explain it to them because they weren't martial artists. They didn't know. I said, look, the moment you break that trust, right, the show is, is done. Like, I can't say I'm not doing that, but I'll do this. Like, the instructor's going to go, no, I get to get out. You know, you know, like, you're either in or you're not, right? I, I One time I trained with, with a shootbox trainer, and um, I was fighting this big dude who was, like, really tall and, and like, 6'3", and it, sparring time came around, and he threw a punch, and I slipped and I hit his ribs because I was trained, if you're fighting a bigger guy, either stay inside or outside. Don't stay in the middle. So I said, I'll fight inside and box in and work the body on this guy. The instructor runs up and he goes, no. Aim for the head. Well, I can't aim for the guy's 6'3". Like, if I aim for the head, he's too tall. He's just going to slip and hit, which is what he did the whole sparring session. I'm aiming for his head like Vanderlei, throwing these punches. And the dude was just stepping out of the way and hitting me. Um, I just left and didn't come back. I didn't tell the guy how to run his class. I didn't say no. I'm not going to. I went, okay. And I got my ass beat the whole sparring session. And then I never trained with that guy again. I'm not going to tell somebody how to run their gym. So that's very important in, in, in martial arts. And mixed martial arts. If you don't like the culture of a gym, you're not going to change it. You're not going to tell the guy, hey, I don't want to do this. We should do that. Okay, well, I would go train somewhere else. Each gym has its culture. You don't like the culture, go to a different gym. So I try to explain that to them. Once I break that bond and I go, no, I'm not doing this because it's dangerous. Well, then it's hard to then go, okay, well, like you want the, the only way the story, the, the story and the show works is if I place myself kind of in that person's hands. And then we'll learn the style because they'll push me out of my comfort zone. If I stop and go, I'm not doing this, it, it breaks the whole, to me, the whole show. I said, look, if something's dangerous or something's unhealthy or unsanitary, remember I got really sick swimming in, in Brazil out in, the, out in the ocean. You guys as producers have to step in and go, no, he can't swim out there in favela water. He's going to get sick. You have to make sure it's safe. And you, if there's a problem, have to object. That was what I told them. I said, we can't, we're not in a position to do that. You have to do it. You know, it's like the corner thrown in the towel, kind of, in a sense. Um, so that came up in India. We're sitting there. Remember, I'd already told them this. We already had this conversation. We're sitting there in India post-fighting. So we had trained, da-da-da, we're all sweaty. And when again, we're, we're training in a dirt pit. So my hands are all black. And the instructor says, please sit with us and eat. Okay, great. We sat down, and there's this big pot of, like, you know, rice, spiced rice, and, and um, really good, you know, Indian food, curry and stuff. And he goes, please. And he dips his hand in, and everybody, everybody just, like, our hands are black with mud. And everybody goes, mm, 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 mm. And I looked at the producer, and he's shooting. He's, like, got his camera, and I go, and it just didn't dawn on him. I, I, I'm not immune to whatever parasites are in this mud. I can't do that. They just kept shooting. 
Then I went, okay. And I ate it with, with my hands, my, my black hands. Every, and everybody's doing it. Everybody's going, nom, 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 all from the same pot. And I went, okay, if I get something, I guess. I wasn't worried about, I was worried about an intestinal parasite because, you know, I'm in India where I'm not from and I have mud all over my hands and I'm eating with my bare hands. <laughs> so anyway, so I turned to the producer like, okay, this is when you're supposed to go, no, 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 Jimmy can't. You know, we got to wash his hands. You know, we got to, you know, we have hand sanitizer in the truck. Let me go get it, you know. And they didn't. And I went, and I I ate it with my bare hands. And so we're sitting there, you know, we had this conversation. We ate the food. Food's delicious. Um, And then we go back to the hotel and I go, guys, that's when you're supposed to go, oh, wait, you know, Jimmy can't with mud on his hands. I can't tell the guy, no, I can't do that. I, you know, I got to do what everybody else is doing unless, you guys step it so so yeah, they were like oh god you know so yeah that was, that was a moment I had there I didn't get sick I didn't get anything everything was fine um, so final fight rolled around and they had a beautiful location for it we were kind of in this back area with trees all around a gorgeous place and we had the final fight now for those that don't know I have a gigantic Hindu tattoo that goes from the back of my neck to my butt and it's the Hindu god Ganesh right I have one on either rib, too, of different gods. But th- th- I didn't have those at the time. So what I noticed in sparring and in the final fight, when I turned like this and I exposed my back at all, he wouldn't hit me there. It was against his religion to hit an image of Ganesha. So he wouldn't do that. So I had to square up a lot. Because I'm like, cause if I had turned, like, you know, kind of Philly shell a little bit and raised my shoulder, he wouldn't hit any of this area here. He wouldn't even throw anything to that side. So I had to like, oh man, I can't do that. I got to square up a little bit just to, you know, give him a target. So I squared up a lot more than I normally would to show him my front. Usually I kind of curl up a lot. Well, he wouldn't even throw a hook that might hit the top of it. So that was another thing. I had to square up and kind of stand tall because I didn't want to expose that because he like, he wouldn't even touch it. When he did, he would like freak. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. And like freak out. So uh, anyway, had the final fight. Ton of respect for the guy I fought, man. He really stepped up and we had a, a fun little back and forth. It was clear that what we weren't going that hard, but it was a lot of fun. And then, you know, we did the, the, the weapons thing. Great. Uh, and then at the end, we, you know, we celebrated with the guys and everything. Um, then they sent us to this resort right on the water for two days there in, in, in southern India, in Kerala. And it was amazing, man. We just swam every day, had mango lassies with every meal right on the water. And it's interesting because it was, once again, kind of rural. Uh, when we were on the beach kids would walk up to me. They don't have tattoos there. That's just not a thing. And so they'd see Ganesh and go, oh, it's Ganesh. And they would also like the, the, the normal like <laughs> social distancing we're doing now. India, they don't really they have that concept. They're much closer when they talk and everything. Well, kids would want to just like start grabbing my back and go like, like they didn't get it was a tattoo. So they go, why doesn't it wash off? And I go, no, it's a tattoo. It's under my skin. If it's under your skin. How can we see it? They, they said, so I would get that all the time. Little kids would like run up and like, why is that? And they like, asked me all these questions. If they spoke English or they would just start speaking in uh, their native language. And they had no concept of, of, of tattoos, but they liked Ganesh. One time when I was in, in Korea, I was getting a back massage. You know, it was post shoot. And they were like, oh, we're going to go to the spa and get a massage. Well, thank you. And so I laid down. I don't know if I told the story in the Korea episode, but I, I laid down on the table and the, the, she won't start. I mean, I'm laying there for like an awkward amount of time. And I got up and I looked around and the three masseuse ladies are praying to my back. And they said, oh, we had, you know, like once they saw that image, they called the other ladies together. And went, oh, look. And, the, and they prayed and they had to finish their prayer and then they could rub my back <laughs> because uh, they were Hindu. So uh, very, very interesting. But great culture, great time, really had a lot of fun. Uh, in southern India. Hopefully I get to go get back at some point. But great time. I hope everybody's safe. I'm going to be doing more stuff now. Um, I had some technical difficulties. I've been working on a project that is coming out soon. And um, anyway, so also uh, I started with ESPN International. And I was supposed to start the week the whole pandemic hit. So they I was supposed to do a weekly show for ESPN International for like the mostly the Australian market about – in, in English about the Australian fighters and all the stuff, uh, post-fight, pre-fight breakdowns for ESPN. And it was supposed to be the day the pandemic started. When it was really, when it really hit. I had a plane ticket to Connecticut and everything. And they went, ah, it's, it's, it's postponed for right now. Just hold off. Well, we're starting to do it remote. 
So I have my first kind of like sit down thing with ESPN on Monday from here. And then uh, we should be doing it remote. So anything I can post w once it's done and cut and all that stuff, I will for sure. But that's the gig I was talking about before. I was trying to work out. I was I had signed with ESPN. It was all good to go for this international show. And then <gasps> everything got postponed. So uh, hopefully things are, are ramping up from home that I can do remotely soon. So anyway, appreciate it. And I will see you guys soon. Stay tuned for the next one, which is um, Hong Kong. Good one. Later, guys.